Hey, what's good, everyone? Welcome to the J Rose Experience. I'm your host, J Rose. Thanks for tuning in. Today, we've got some poetic powerhouses in the building. Two of my favorite spoken word poets in New York City. We have Nia Mora and Alyssa Green who are joining us to talk about their poetic projects and giving us some insight on what it's like to be the mother behind the mic. Later on, we'll play off the top your favorite random improv game and you'll have a chance to play with us too. So please stay tuned in. We'll be right back with our first guest. You're tuning into the J-Rose Experience where creatives come to keep growing. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the J. Rose Experience. I'm your host, J. Rose, and I'm here with my guest, Nia Mora, poet and author from Harlem who recently launched her online boutique called Petals and Poise. Yes. And she's here to talk about it. So please give a warm welcome to Nia. Yay! Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Yes. So I want to get right into it because Let's go. there's a lot of stuff to talk about, and I know you have a lot to say. So I want to dig into your writing. Now, you're not just a writer and an author and a poet, but you're also a spoken word poet. Um, and in my opinion, one of the most powerful spoken word voices in New York City. But that's just my opinion. I'm just saying. You so, sound like a smart girl. Yeah. <laughs> see, she knows. So I want to know, how did you make that transition from being a writer to actually getting on stage and performing? Um, so it was kind of like a two-fold or a two-part um, transition for me mm -hmm. because I wasn't new to the stage realistically um, in the past in my previous time writing because I re I just returned to poetry. Oh. I left it alone for like 12 years. What? Why? Uh, because I was, yeah, I'm about to tell you all my business yes. she rose, right? Uh, but I was in this like raggedy marriage. <laughs> and, and yeah, my poetry wasn't really supported there, and it was kind of interfering with the process mm. of the relationship. So I put it on the side, mm. like maybe that would help it work, help us grow, help us thrive. It really didn't. So yeah. now we're working on divorcing, and now Good I'm for a you. poet. Yes, divorce so, and become a poet. That's how you do it, baby. Uh, <laughs> So, tell me about that, though. That's really interesting. Like, what was it like trying to decide whether to focus on your passion or focus on something that you've made a commitment to? It was hard. It was very difficult um, making that decision. However, at the end of the day, I had to focus on what makes me thrive and how I'm able to survive and what I'm really, really good at so that I could just continue and keep having momentum and have something to really mm -hmm. live for and look forward to doing uh, and being. And so, and that's how I kind of came back to poetry. And yes. then that's how I came back to the stage, which originally I wasn't going to come back to the mm -hmm. stage. I was just going to share the writing, but a very wonderful friend of mine, a brilliant, a wise friend of mine, uh, shout out to that man, Jaime, he said, you could do it. You yes. should be on the stage. You belong on the stage. Yes, you do. And I'm going to support you in any way that I possibly can so you could do it. Yes. So I listened to him. I did it. He honored his part. So now I'm doing my part. And now I'm here. I'm here. here. Well, I'm glad that you came back to the stage because when I first saw you perform, I was just like, yo, who is this chick? She is like a force to be reckoned with. Um, you just have a way of just captivating your audience with just a few words, you know, and it's just like, it, it really like awes me. And I think you're one of the, one of the best spoken word poets in New York City. Y'all better check her out. Um, so I'm guessing that this transition of coming out of this relationship and pushing forward to get on stage, is this kind of what prompted your book? Yes. That did prompt my book. I felt like I couldn't just have um, these pieces of writing floating around everywhere. <laughs> she's come <laughs> undone. Like yes. uh, she's come undone. I couldn't have these myriad pieces of writing 
floating around all over the place. I yeah. felt like I wanted to make something succinct and mm. something that would represent my journey. And I had so much writing. Like, yeah. that book is full. Yes, it so, is. I wanted to take all of it and put it together so that it would become a living thing and not just these random pieces of yeah. writing. Now, where does the title, where did you get the title from? Like, where did that come from? That title came from the title poem of the book, which as I started to go into writing the poetry, I realized that I've had, I've had another writing life and I've written other, in that 12 years that I wasn't writing poetry, I still couldn't put my pen down. So I channeled it in other ways and I wrote other things. Yeah. And when I thought about, I used to primarily serve a Christian audience. Yeah. In my other writing and in my poetry, I explore topics that traditionally we don't discuss. Openly. Really? Um, I didn't know that about you. Learn something new every day. Um, that we don't discuss in Christianity. That often, but are definitely part of who we are and make up the composition of us as a person. Yeah. And so I knew that as I start exploring these things, people are going to look and say things and think about it in a funny way. Like, yeah. what is she doing? What's happening? She's losing it. Yeah. But really, it's all coming together for me mm. right now in this moment. But they're going to say she's come undone. Yeah. Well, they're coming from a different perspective. How are you like? How did you get into writing like more faith based? And how do you like come? Like, how do people accept that that you're writing about? Were you writing like religious poetry? Like, about no, I wasn't writing. I wasn't writing. Poetry like, I don't, <laughs> I'm like, were you like writing that Jesus poems? Like, I wasn't. I wish I could do that. I wish I could do that. Shout out to Victor B because yes, does, oh Victor my gosh, Victor does that really well. Um, and I wish I could do that. I don't know how to do that. Okay. Um, so I was writing though, like I was writing full length, like novels, um, oh. nonfiction work. And they were all centered around yes, yeah. Jesus. And I think if you look at my poetry, you'll see that there's still like lots of biblical allusions, biblical references. So my faith and God is yeah. still, still there. It's still there. It's just being handled in a different way. Yeah. So being from Harlem, do you think that that affected your style of writing? Absolutely. I incorporate, I think that I incorporate the city very much, completely yeah. and fully. You have a whole piece my, about Harlem. I do. I, do. <laughs> I love that piece. I do. Like, I think that it's very much a part of who I am. I am a, a city girl. Like, yeah. my, I sweat asphalt. I bleed concrete. Like, okay. <laughs> that's it. That's an awesome. Typical poet. Always got some bars to drop, right? <laughs> I sweat asphalt. I love that. <laughs> so... Now, beyond the writing, you also, um, you taught, right, high school English. I'm currently teaching now. So, are there any st students that you found a connection with because of writing? I think that I, I haven't found a connection yet, but it's opening up doors and pathways for them now now that they know that i do it professionally mm. they take my class a lot more seriously ah. i think when they first thought i was just teaching english it was like Ooh, whoop -doo -doo -doo. yeah uh, and now that they know that i am a poet and that i have a book like yeah now they're starting to take it a lot more seriously mm. so i think that in that way it's become effective but i haven't really met anyone yet who's like i want to be a writer yeah. i want to do that i think that's a, a lot art and there's not a lot of time like I could go on forever but New York City curriculum is not set up to support creative writing yeah uh, that's a at this current stage yeah. so they don't even have the opportunity to know right now that they want to or could possibly be a writer be a writer yeah did you have were you able were you lucky enough to have that when you were coming up like did you have a mentor or an English teacher that yeah yeah who was yes. that I had I had two really phenomenal English teachers, I think, that affected my path. One was uh, Mr. Yosevoli. And I've looked, I've searched for this man. Like, hopefully, somebody on YouTube... Somebody! Share this find, Mr. Find him. Yosevoli! We need him! Uh, he, put, he pushed me, and he pushed me in a way that current day teaching would frown upon what he did, but it was the best thing yeah. ever. Every writing piece that I turned into him, he did not write a comment on it. He would just give it a grade. Mm. And it wouldn't be a bad grade. It would be a great grade. Um... The highest you could get in his class was a star. Then it was check plus, then yeah. check, then check minus. And I would always get a check plus or I'd get a star. 
and no comment. And I would look at my, he had this beautiful penmanship, all this cursive writing on everybody's paper. And it was like, I didn't do anything good enough here for him to discuss. What? Okay. Yeah. Next piece, I'm going in. <laughs> Next piece, I'm going in. Next assignment, I'm going to do it so well that he has to say something. I'm yeah. going to compel him to say something to yeah. me. And he didn't say anything to me the whole entire year. <laughs> Oh my God! Nothing. Not one. Comment. I would have had so much anxiety. Like I know I'm passing, but tell me something. Something exactly. And it was like, but I, it didn't give me anxiety. It just made me want to be so good that I could make him say something. Like, what do I have to do to make him say something? Like at least a wow, or like and a smiley face. He didn't say anything until the end of the year. And in my, they don't do this anymore. Like I had, you know, those autograph books. Yes, yes. And yes. he wrote in there that Throwback. he could tell I was a good writer. And that I knew I was good. So if he said something, I would never be better. Ooh. And so now he's going to tell me Damn. everything great about me. And in that space, he wrote all that really like great stuff. Wow. Then. And he was right because I did know I was good. Yeah. And I wouldn't have done more than what I was doing because I know it was enough. Yeah, you'd have been like, I got it. Yeah, 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 you wouldn't yeah. even try to do more. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. Wow. What about the other? You said there was two. Yes, was Francine one. Witt, who in high school would not allow me to use any cuss words <laughs> in my writing. And she let other kids do it. But she was like, you need to challenge yourself yeah. to go outside of what you have. Yeah. Go past your range yes. and do more. She introduced me to prosody and writing sestinas and writing poetry in a formal way. I don't do it often, but she gave me enough exposure and experience yeah. that I can be able to say... I can do it. Yeah. And that's always good. Like even yeah. if you even if you don't do it, you don't adopt it, but yeah, I know the rules. Yeah. And I could break them. I'm entitled to it. I got yeah. a license. There you go. Okay, right. girl. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so pedals and poise. Yes. All right. How did you get into like the whole fashion thing and and starting like an online boutique? Like it was something I wanted to do for a long time. I wanted to create a whole lifestyle brand around my writing. And the first go round, like when I was writing fiction and all that, I thought that was where it was going to go and that's where it was going to take me. Yeah. And it really didn't take me there. <laughs> surprise, I, I, surprise. Whoop, no, not today. Uh, you got to try again. You got to be quicker than that. And yes. It wasn't working out that way. And I left that alone. I abandoned it a little bit. Then I started performing. And as I was performing... People would ask me, oh, you look great. Where'd you get this from? Where'd you get that from? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm willing. Like, I'm like, I got it from rainbows. That's yeah, from word. I'm like, like Burlington. Yeah, oh. like I was willing to say where I got it from. And then I started seeing people like posting stuff. Like I went here, I got, and I was like, wait, they listening to me. Oh. They went and they got what I said. So why am I sending them to somebody else and they could shop with me? Yeah. You like you like my style? Okay, good. Let, let me hook you up real quick. Okay. Let me hook you up with, Keep it in the family. Keep it in the house. <laughs> okay, so um, oh gosh, I could talk about this all day. So, what are like some of your fashion like inspirations when you are like creating your style? Uh, fashion inspirations. Let me see. I feel like I go between two two spaces, but maybe I stay in one space really a lot. And I feel like I really love uh, stylistically Rihanna, like mm. bold yeah. choices, stuff that you don't see regularly but then she'll mix it with something that is very simple and very normal yeah so then it almost feels like yes you should be walking down the street in all sequence like yeah this like, shirt is hot yes. it's fire right here yes. she's, she's uh -huh. like giving the shimmy <laughs> i love it so really i think dope. that like stylistically that's someone who i really admire yeah in terms of her style i also really admire tracy ellis ross mm, yes i fire. really like um, Christian Siriano as a designer. Okay. So somewhere in that space yeah. of just like grand, but also With some I got to do laundry too. Yes. <laughs> grand, but we's going to the laundromat. <laughs> I like that. I got a fun question for you. Okay. Um, if you could go back in time to another decade, um, what would it be? And what would be the first thing you do Ooh. when you get there? Okay. So what would it be? I would definitely go back to the 20s. Ooh. Uh, so of course, the Harlem Renaissance. Like, yes. <laughs> I don't know, I'm mad. 
So I definitely go there. I mean, I think there are two decades I really admire um, in terms of literary accomplishments and in terms of movements for black people. And so the 20s would be one of them. And I would just definitely be a flapper. I would go spend some nights at the Dark Tower and <laughs> just, you know, hang out, find out how I could get into the niggerati. Like, <laughs> y'all let me in here. She knows all the hot spots from the 20s. I <laughs> And so that would be the first thing that I would do. I would find Zora Neale Hurston, tell her, let's go shopping, give me the tea on everybody. I know she knew it. I know she knew it. So we'd do that. And then I'd go to the 70s for the Black Arts Movement. Okay. And so I'd definitely like to, you know, kick it with Amiri Baraka, do a little stuff with him, hang out with Sonia Sanchez. Okay. You know, just work the scene. And <laughs> work the time traveling scene. <laughs> yes. I like, love it. Those are the places and the spaces I would want to be where black people have the opportunity to create art, but also use their voice in a political way. Yes. So that's where I would like to be. I love that. Oh my gosh. So speaking of voice, you think you can give us uh, some poetry? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, we're gonna have a performance from Nia Mora. Stay tuned. She is celebrating when her neck rolls, finger snaps, and clap backs are in your defense. But when she uses her two feet to stand up for herself, she is rabid, labeled the savage, the punchline for any fella willing to don a crooked wig or lipstick for the gram, but we'd never let them outline your body in crooked chalk. Though you don't care how they dare talk about us. Whether we end up dead in a freezer or dead in a cell, we gotta beg you to say her name. And nobody cared about our Me Too moments until they gentrified them. Still, we stood right in line beside them, marching, shouting, chanting, and tweeting, because sometimes the black woman's plight is more physical than psychological. We got a tendency to stand for people who wouldn't even fall for us, including our brothers who willingly turn a blind eye to our pain while we resurrect their dead dreams and broken bodies in the streets and get up and march for them in these streets. But when he get on, he get gone. Self-fulfilling prophecy like the songs say, he gonna leave your ass for a white girl. And even though he can't tell you why he love her so, he got a litany of reasons for why he hate your ass. As if he would exist without the black woman. Come on, she birthed you, bathed you, raised you. Gave you your swag. Stop acting like a clown. You know your daddy wasn't around. She the one who taught you how to give it up and how to put it down. So why is it that at the end of the day, when she finds that her dreams have been ravished, you are nowhere near in sight. You see, that's the crooks of the black woman's plight. She's been discarded by society, left unguarded by her mate, then served her pain on a plate and asked to eat it quietly in a corner so nobody remembers. What's her name? The black woman's plight. Check out my people at Regal Star Apparel for some dope hoodies, t-shirts, sweatsuits, and more. I really love their style. Their designs have this creative yet classic artsy vibe to it. Their clothes is comfortable, affordable, and it's just all around dope. And all our viewers and listeners can get 10% off when they use code JROSE10 at checkout. Shop Regal Star Apparel at regalstaronline.com. Follow them on IG at Regal Star Apparel. Welcome back to the JROSE Experience. I'm your host, Jay Rose, and I'm here with my next guest, the beautiful Elise Green, who is a poet from Queens, yeah. right? <laughs> Queens, finally, Queens is in the building. Um, and she recently was part of a huge project. It was a spoken word album called Voices of New York, yes. right? And she's here to talk about it. So let's please give a warm welcome to Elise. <laughs> thank you for coming. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm so happy that you were able to make it. Yes. So I really want to dig into this Voices of New York because I think it was a really dope idea. So tell me about Voices of New York. What was the focus of that album? Well, ABP kind of just hit up a group of, of us, and he's just like, you know, he has this idea. He didn't really tell us until it was put out, so we didn't know, like, what was the main focus. At least I didn't. Oh, wow. And he kind of just put everything together, and when I heard it, I was like, oh, this is so dope. Like, it was really crazy. Thank so you. he just, like, reached out to you guys, asked mm -hmm. you guys to record some poetry. Mm -hmm. Like, when he came, because, you know, he comes from London, so he'd come over, and he was just like, you know, I got this idea. He was, like, telling us one by one in certain groups and pieces, but then he put together, like, this big whole group, and then, you know, we were all talking amongst the group, and he was just telling us about his idea and what he wants to do, and all the artists that he had. It was, I think, like, oh, my God, how so many? many yeah, that's what I wanted to know, <laughs> because when it was promoted, I mean, I was, like, it was, like, all over my feed. Mm -hmm. it was, I felt like everybody was in it. How well, many? initially, I, it was probably over 40 that he wanted. 
Wow. That I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but together, all of the albums with 26, 27 tracks, if I'm not mistaken. So all those different artists on each track. So yeah, it was a lot. Wow, and it's all poetry. It's all poetry. Um, I know there was one Ratchet Scholar. I know she's more of a rapper, rapper. Yeah. So she kind of was doing a little bit more of the rap thing. A. Charles is also a rapper. But yes. kind of did it in a spoken word um, form. So it was really cool. It was really cool. So it was all done. Everybody kind of recorded their piece yes. and sent it to him? No, we all actually had dates where we met to go to the studio. It was pretty much one day, and we just all went through it. It was really, like, crazy, oh, wow. but it was cool. So it would be, like, say, four or five of us in the studio at one time. We'd all have to, like, be really quiet. Yeah. And we'd just go through it. And, yeah, you know, it was cool. I'm actually happy because I didn't want to do it. And I was, like, really nervous. I doubted myself. Why? And I was like, ah, oh, it's just a personal thing. Like, I just didn't feel like that was something that I could do. So I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do it. Then the last minute, I was like, just do it. So I went. I did it. And I actually only did my take of Woman of the Night once. That was really? It. Mm-hmm. I was no about to ask you what nothing. piece you did. Yeah. <laughs> so let me, let's touch on that a little bit. Like, where is this something that you feel sometimes in your creative process when you're trying to do something new? Do you feel like sometimes you're like, uh, I shouldn't be doing this because I... All the time. Don't. So how do you how do you snap yourself out of it? I just tell myself to do it. You just say no do matter it. what. I'm very impulsive sometimes, so it's like just do it. Like if I feel like all right, I can't go on that stage and I can't do this poem because whatever reason, that same reason, I go up there and I do it because do I told it. myself that I couldn't do it. Like anybody that's ever doubted me, I think that's what I take up on yes. the stage, and I'm just like you know what, I can do it. If I want to do it, if I really want to do it, I could do it. So I just take that one. Let's. Um, I do want to ask you about your poetry. I want to dig a little deeper. Um, Because I've seen you perform many, many times, Mm -hmm. and there are some pieces that are just so emotionally driven that you literally bring to your, like, I've cried Mm -hmm. so many times watching you perform, um, because you just have a way of just really tapping into people's emotions. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide how deep you're going to go in a piece? And like, how do you prepare yourself to perform something so like, emotional? (laughs) It's not easy, I'll be honest. I am I mean, I'm very vulnerable regardless, but anything that I've ever written, I've started writing just because it's, you know, me. So I want to talk about whatever I couldn't express and getting on stage, it's just like, I have to express it. So I'm just going to give you me, no matter what. I mean, you know, some days I'm really into that emotion, so I can't really perform the way I would like to. Sometimes I cry while I'm performing it, and it is what it is. I'm not yeah. gonna stop. Like I'll turn around, you know. Th- 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 thugs can't cry. Thugs, thugs can't cry. Thugs, can't cry. thugs don't cry. <laughs> don't cry but in baseball. No, yeah. I definitely I've cried many times on stage, and I just literally tell myself to just let it out there. And yeah, it makes me feel good when other people come up to me and was like, "Yo, you know, I felt that. I resonated yeah. with that." And it doesn't make me feel alone. No. You know, because a lot of times we go through things in life and we just feel like, you know what, nobody else deals with this. Nobody goes through this, and there's mad people going through yeah. it. You forget that because you're in your own world. So yeah. yeah. So how do you, um, so what was the hardest piece that you ever had to perform? And why did you still perform it if you knew it was hard to perform? Um, honestly, it was a poem I wrote about my ex. And really? It talked about the, you know, physical abuse and everything that I went through, you know, my mentality, not being able to gain weight for two years because I was just depressed. Ooh, girl, really and, deep into yeah. those emotions and... I told myself, like, a lot of my friends, they was like, do it. People are going to feel it. Like, recite that. People need to hear this. They'll make different decisions and so on and so forth. And I'm like, oh, no, man. I don't know if I could do that. And then I tried it once. It was really hard. You know, like, that was actually the first time I performed that piece was um, for your open mic oh, <laughs> when you had me. Probably and- <laughs> one time, one of the many times I've cried watching was, her perform. Yeah, it was really, really hard. And I just was like, you know what? I got to do it. I got to do it. It's probably the only time I'll ever do it, but I'll let it out, you know? And after that moment, I kind of performed it here and there, you know, but being that it's a very long piece, (laughs) I really don't perform it too much, but whoo, that was hard to just really like, a lot of times when you perform, you have to go back to that moment yeah, and relive that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's the hardest part because it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to feel that. I don't want to, you know, but there's someone else. And honestly, um, my friend Angie, she actually, you know, one day she just hit me up. She sent me this long poem and she's like, you know, like, you're so brave. You're so this or that. And I'm just like, what about me? Like, if yeah. only you knew I'm not as strong as you think I am. And, you know, she said that it helped that poem helped her make better decisions within her life. And ooh, oh. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, I literally was on Jamaica Avenue and I burst out crying. Yeah. I couldn't do anything. I was just standing there. I'm like, oh my God, like I made a difference in somebody else's life. If you don't take anything in life, like to just make a difference besides, you know, being a mom or a good friend, yeah. like 
just making a difference in somebody else's life and knowing it and they tell you it's like it's a it's a beautiful feeling so really. do you find that that experience is sort of healing for you it's very it's honestly i would say performing or writing or anything like all of it is a healing aspect the real work is you know within yourself you take those changes every day but it is a helpful like it's like a step yeah you know to doing that healing and everything like that so yeah it's a part of it so yeah that's very true um now we know each other yes you know more than just like hey i know a cool poet mm -hmm. you know um you I've, yeah <laughs> we've, we've you know, you've been to my events many times. I featured you before. And, you know, I do know you a little bit more, like, on a personal mm -hmm. level. So there are things about your past and your upbringing that I always found very interesting and intriguing. And I want to talk about this. Um, so I remember one time you were at one of our events and you made, an, you know, you shared something really deep and personal about yourself that I had no idea. And since then, I've always wanted to, like, mm -hmm. pick at it. Mm -hmm. um, so you grew up in an adopted household. Yes. And what I want to know is, for one, how was it when you found out that you were adopted? Mm -hmm. um, what was that like? I was actually really young. <laughs> and, I mean, I was very smart. My mom kind of just had a moment. She put, We were in the car together. She was just talking. And she's like, you know, we're going to go through these steps because... I didn't know all like you know all these years they was going through these steps these processes of you know going back and forth to meet with these people tell them how they're treating me and so on and so yeah. forth and I actually got to an incident because of one time I went and I was like you know are you getting beatings and stuff how does that make you feel so I did tell them I said yes you know I get beatings because that's normal you know? yeah and that was like a big thing and they were just like you know gonna take me away and my mom's like you can't tell them that they're gonna take you from us and I'm like what do you mean you I can't no no yeah. like you're my mom you know so I'm like no and then. Like, we fixed it, everything worked out and everything, but for me, like, the whole adoption and, ah, it was confusing for a while. Yeah. <laughs> to know, like, she just sat me down and she's like, yeah, you have two moms, you know, and this is the situation. Never, she never really told me what my mom did. She just said she smoked cigarettes. Nothing yeah. Like that, you know, young mind, I wouldn't have been able to understand what a drug is or whatever. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, but I really didn't like feel bad. I kind of just wondered who she was and mm -hmm. what she looked like, because there was a woman that I did remember had... That was my face. Same like, face. <laughs> same yeah. face. And I was just like, I didn't know that to be my mom. I just thought that was just some lady. Like the yeah. last time I ever saw her, she gave me a dollar and she had to leave. And I just remember as me being an adult, like when she was leaving, it was really hard for her. Yeah. And she just kept looking back. She wanted to cry. And I just like, that's the only memory I have of her yeah. until I got older, of course. But yeah. So, so you were able to connect with her later on in your adult life? I, yeah, I called her. Um, I got her number from my aunt. My aunt gave it to me. And, you know, I called her. We just would talk on the phone for like two, three years because I was like afraid. And then... I'm very, I don't know what's the word I'm looking for, but I was, like, worried about how my mom would take it that raised me. Oh, so, you didn't want to, like, her to I feel offended? Feel, yeah, or, like, I didn't want her to think that... Oh, you're replacing know. the woman that was there right. for you. Right. Yeah, I actually yeah. wrote her poem so that she felt a little bit yeah. more, you know, I told her, I was like, yes, that's my mom, but you are my mother. Like, yeah. She's just There's the one that gave me life, and you took care of me, my scraped knees, all that stuff. <laughs> like, you know, taught me not to cry, you know? I ain't no problem. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs don't cry. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah, but... Is yeah. there, is there, do you think that growing up in that, that type of environment or I guess in that type of situation, did that affect your writing? Um, yes. That's actually, I started trying to sing. I cannot sing. <laughs> just throwing that out there. I cannot sing. But I wanted, like, I just knew there was things I had to say. Yes. So I was like, you know what? I can't sing. This isn't working out. You know, maybe I can write songs one day, but no, let me try and be more poetic. I don't know. Yeah. Let me figure this out. So I tried it and then I was like, okay, I like this. I really like this. And then I just kept doing it. Like I always felt alone. Like yeah. I always felt like I was different. I seen how my dad was with my sister and I like, I considered it like this. My sister was my dad's baby. My brother was um, my mom's Mom, baby. baby. And then there was just Were you me. like the middle child? No, I'm the baby. Oh, <laughs> I'm really? the last one. We're all a year apart. Oh, and so you felt you didn't have a parent for yourself. Right. And I, I didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was just, it was really weird. I didn't have anyone that I kind of like connected to. So it was more so my mom because I knew of what she's done for me and yeah. the and story. So I always was mom's baby. Like I'd go everywhere with them. Yeah. I didn't feel like a connection. Yeah. You know, I never had a mother daughter connection. So. so your writing was like your My ways mom of creating. Express. Yeah. I literally wrote about everything under the sun. Wow. <laughs> so. I have a fun question for you. Because I'm where I don't want to start crying. Yeah. You yeah, always yeah. make me cry. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So <laughs> if you could have a song play 
every time you walk down the street, what song would it be? Oh man, I am like multiple different people on different days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today with your little hot sexy <laughs> outfit, to leather skirt, oh, where man. you going? Um, we'll be playing. Oh, this is crazy. You know, t- I, honestly, I've been in a different kind of mood. So I was on some little Kim, Big Mama little thing. Little Big okay. Mama things. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that was the vibe today. I don't know yes. why. But yeah. Well, you got it going on tonight, girl. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, that's my joint. <laughs> yeah, I like that song. Good yeah. choice. Good choice. <laughs> so um, I want to make my audience cry. Mm-hmm. So you think you could do a piece for us? Yes. Definitely. (laughs) All right, stay tuned. We'll be right back with a performance from Elise. (laughs) I I am a woman of the night. I drown in drinks so that I can silence the thoughts in my mind. One drink at a time, knowing I'm not being kind to my body, but it just, it feels so damn good. Not to overthink. Not to rehearse scenes that may never be played out for a moment I'm me. Maybe a bit too carefree, but at least I'm living. When I wake up tomorrow, I can be forgiving, but right now, I'm living my glorious sin right now. This is how my life begins. Weekends are all I need. And of course, my liver soaks so that the me inside my mind is no longer choked and hiding behind the thoughts that constantly leave me lost or questioning more of how I should be. In the night, I am free. There are no voices in my head yelling to let me be. There is no other versions of me. See, she'll never fight, just dance and climax to new heights. She inhales life with a thirst that quenches better than Sprite, no spite in her heart. For once, she's not falling apart. Everything is as it should be. See, she knows if she was home, she'd be curled up in fatal fetal defeat, gripping her knees, shaking and praying for her sanity because this life ain't never been easy. She gives life all she can, and every time she gets enough air to breathe, it's like life crushes her windpipe just enough to self-repair, never fully leaving her in despair. It's like like her self-care is amusing. So she figures, I mean, I figure, why try? When the reasons to abide are the same reasons that you cry, the same reasons that you die, why? And they say tomorrow is a promise, so why can't I be the woman of the night every night? Why can't I fight my demons with a little bit of help? Do we always have to be brave? Why can't sometimes we be saved? Do we always have to know what to say? I know I'm comfortable in my shades of gray because not everything is black and white. Sometimes it's purple, sometimes it's green, sometimes it's red, and sometimes, sometimes it's just all a dream. Whether it's tax season, the holidays, or whatever falls in between, you want to make sure that you're being smart with your money. So go visit my girl, Queen Candace at the Queen Blueprint to learn how to gain your financial freedom. You could get a personalized debt payoff plan, a full financial overview, and learn to repair your relationship with money. Smarter Money Moves are waiting for you at www.thequeenblueprint.com or call 877-387-BLUE. Use code JROSE20 for 20% off of all our financial services. Welcome back to the JROSE experience. I'm your host, JROSE, and I've invited my guests back on set so that we can dig a little deeper into a nice little group discussion. So what we're going to talk about, because we are all moms, Mm -hmm. yes, (laughs) so we're going to dig into the mothers behind the mic, and we're going to talk about how we balance being moms and entrepreneurs and creatives at the same time. You ready? You ready? ready? Yes. (laughs) Okay. So first question is, what are some of the challenges that you face being a single mother and a creative? Okay. Yes. Let me go first. All right. So for me personally, it's just always having a sitter. Man, <laughs> having a sitter is hard. I don't have, like, you know, many people. I just have my family, like, my cousins, they which are my age or younger. So, yeah, having a sitter is the hardest thing for me. I don't know. And money. Oof. Ooh, child. <laughs> money. Yeah, kids are expensive. <laughs> they are expensive. I agree. Having a sitter is very complicated because I don't come from, a like, a huge family. So, there's not always someone home. So, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah go stay with TT. Go stay yeah. here. Like, so I don't always have that as an option and you want to know that your kids are safe. Right. So it's deciding and leveraging like which shows are 
the most important. Uh, yeah. What shows can I do? And just being able to speak like very openly, very honestly to people because people, um, I think they don't realize that we're moms right. or they just don't take it into consideration. So somebody might tell you two weeks in advance and for them, that's a lot of time. But mm-hmm. the reality is for a mom, mm-hmm. two weeks is no time. That's like you told me the same day of the show. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, need, right. <laughs> I need more than right. two weeks yeah. to get everything situated. Yeah, and so right. I like everybody's life, perspectives, what they're doing. Like, and kids hard. have their own schedule. Like yeah. a whole situation that you have to figure out does what I'm doing work with their situation. Mm-hmm. Now, do you ever are ever in situations where you kind of have to bring your kids with you? Absolutely. Oh, I know. I mean, I I knew the answer to that already because I've met oh, both your your yes, children. Yes, definitely. I've definitely met her kids too. So yes. Yeah. Now, yeah, how um how do your children respond to being like? Do they feel like you're dragging them to like another oh, show man. or? Yeah. My daughter loved it in the beginning. She was so excited because I made her a part of my, my performance. And she's like, yeah, we're going to do this. When are you going? When are you going? And then after that, I was just like, can we go home? Like, <laughs> I got now. Like, when are we going? We're not leaving yet? Like, I'm like, all right, we got 10 more people. 10? 10 more people? I want to go home now. I'm tired. Mm. I'm like, all right. Yeah, there are definitely <laughs> venues that my kids pervert over other venues. Yeah. So it's like, oh, we're going there? Woo, yes, sign us up. We want to go. And then there are others that's like, no way. And in the <laughs> beginning, I felt bad. And then there was one show I was doing, and I was saying my poem. And then I heard somebody saying it, too. And I was like, no one here could know this. And I looked, and it was my daughter saying oh, it with me. Best. And I was like, ah, oh, yes. I won. This is yes. That's it. <laughs> It doesn't matter who don't like it. She said it. That's, that's it. it. That's it. That's mm-hmm. it. It's really great in those yeah. moments. Do you find that your creative, like, your the creative side of you is, like, transferring into them? Like, do oh, you yeah. see them wanting to write also and things like that? When we're home. My daughter's very shy. And, which yes, is, yes. you know, so I try to break her out by bringing her more. So if she sees me do it, because she feels like I'm super thing. Like, I can do whatever in the world. That's break my great. knees and I still do it. And I can't. <laughs> like, she knows, but we, like, my, me and my daughter, we have a different relationship. Like, we talk about everything under the sun. This man hurt me. Don't let that man hurt you. You know, so we're different. But yeah. I definitely bring her to try to make sure that she can build it up. And when she's home, I see it, like, how she handles certain situations in school and not being afraid versus, you know, home and when she's with certain people or around certain people when she's on the train. Yeah. She'll randomly be like, oh, I should do a song right now, right? I should do it. I'm like, do that. Go ahead. You want me to sing on the train? And she just does it. She She'll sings on the suit. train? She, if oh I do my gosh. Yes, so yeah. So you've done like subway performances before? Well, I have, actually, but not with her. Yeah. But usually when it's me and her, like we have this little thing from a Tyler Perry movie. So like, it's a, a, a song or something? Yeah. So I sing and I'm like, oh, I have a question. And she'll be like, what is your question? And we're always on the train. Oh. So she literally does it. She'll be like, sing the song, sing it louder, mommy. And I'm like, all right, I don't know, but I do it because I don't want her to feel like if I can't do it, you know, yeah. so I do it. I'll be out there looking like fool, but <laughs> I do it. <laughs> How about this? You have two girls, right? Two. Yeah. And do you find that they are like starting to try to like write poetry and stuff? They, uh, the younger one, not so much. The older one, she's written a couple of poems and she's like, oh, read it, check it, correct it and everything. Oh my gosh. Um, and I'm like trying to get her like, perform it, perform it, please. Because one of them is like really like profound on the bones of slaves. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, okay. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And so she won't perform it yet, but they've always been creative in a way and so and I've always whatever they want to do and be whether it's for five minutes five days five years like I support it so my oldest daughter she's for a while wanted to be a Broadway actress Mm -hmm. so we did all the theater classes we did all the shows we did all the things now she wants to be a lawyer whatever (laughs) but I'm here for it as long whatever she wants to do as long as it funds my retirement in Palm Springs (laughs) be that do that Um, yes and the younger one wants to be a fashion designer but I think that the way in which my creativity is transferring for them, even though it's a different medium, is just letting them know that they can create in any way, shape, or form yeah. that they want to. Because yes. I don't follow a script. I don't necessarily do things the way that other people do them. Yeah. So that enables them to know that they can create whatever they want within whatever uh, exists yeah. in the, the field they step into. Yeah. That's really amazing. Now, how, how are you using your superpowers as a mother to pass on that legacy to your children like how are you solidifying that they're picking up your values and your morals 
Oh man, go ahead. You see, you started. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like they see, they see my work ethic. Mm-hmm. And so even though they may never like want to take on my publishing company when I'm dead and gone, like they'll sell it off somewhere. But they're workers. They know how they know how to work. They know what it means to work. They know what it means to be on time. Mm-hmm. They know what it is to be prepared. They mm-hmm. know what it is to practice, to rehearse, and get themselves ready. And I see that in them, you know, even up until like my oldest daughter, she was sick and I was like, you know, you can stay home. And she was like, no, I can't. I've already committed to this oh task. I can't stay home. My daughter and, been like, I'm staying home. Yeah, no, I'm like, Thanks. stay, stay, like stay. And she's like, I can't, I've already committed. And when I heard her say that, I could hear myself because wow. I've already committed. So you, I gave you my word. So I'm going to show up. Yeah. And so I know that that part of me is going to continue. Yes. And both of them are very much like that it doesn't once they've signed on to something i'm here and you're going to get the best of me out of that and that is my legacy yes like the way that you work the way that you show up Mm -hmm. it's commitment and you do it all the way through yeah Mm -hmm. how about you how are you passing that legacy on she since she's still a little young because she's six so yeah she definitely has this thing you know where she spits everything back at me (laughs) you know it doesn't matter what it is it could be the smallest thing to the biggest thing like i don't know um the big things i would say like things about life and you know handling certain situations like if i tell somebody piss me off and you know she'll spit the harsh things that i'd be telling her and then i'm like who 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 are you who raised you oh am i the mom or are you the mom she's putting you you on she's schooling you to get your shit together like the smallest things like if i left something or i didn't look for something i i I bypass it yeah you didn't look for it i'll be like all right child all right got that you got that but she be right sometimes so i can't really be mad at her but definitely (laughs) but she has a lot of me in her she spends a lot of time with me so there's many times like you know i'll see her handle situations or talk with her dad about stuff and i'm like look at that's me. Oh, Aww. this is so, I love this. It's great, you know, but yeah. What is something that you learned from your children? What have, what's something that your children taught you? To embrace who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, I was getting prepared one day for a, a show, and someone said something to me that was very disheartening. Uh, and my youngest daughter, she was like, Mom, Go be the wild queen that you are. Yes. Like, oh my gosh. I don't have time for this. Can she be my spirit? I, girl? Like, I, like, I, I don't have time for this. I'm a queen. I'm mm-hmm. wild. I'm out here. That's it. <laughs> That's what, what did your daughter teach you? Man, my daughter was three and a half or four. And I was going through a bad breakup. And I had, you know, she, that was someone that she considered to be a parent to her. So, yeah. you know, I had to talk with her. I was like, hey, would it be okay if such and such doesn't come back anymore? And she just looked at me and immediately answered. She was like, hey. It's okay. I don't care. And I was like, you sure? She's like, yeah, it's not okay for to make people cry for you and then they come back and cry for you and then come back. And I was just like, wow. The, like, I, I felt good, but it was just like, damn. damn. <laughs> she had to <laughs> learn that lesson now. Right. And it's yes. just like, why, like, why didn't I take heed to that? Like, you know, sometimes when you feel like you're in love and all that stuff, you just deal with the most. And it's like this three and a half year old is just like, get it together. No. You don't need that. You don't deserve yeah. that. Do better. And I'm like, oh, okay. You said, who? I'm what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I think my, my daughter taught me a lesson once where, <laughs> it's a true story. Um, <laughs> I had a situation. I was in a relationship and I had a situation with like text messages. And my, my daughter was like, why didn't you just delete the messages? And I was like, <laughs> Oh, I wanted to pull over and be like, get the fuck out of the car. <laughs> Don't you think I wanted to do that? I forgot. <laughs> but the hard. fact that like they just know mm-hmm. like all the answers to mm-hmm. to like I always said if you have a big problem, present your problem to a child because right. they will give you the biggest solution. Right. Oh my gosh. See, it's not easy. So thank you so much for giving me some of that insight on how to be a mom and a creative. I know it's not easy. Okay. So anyone that knows me knows that I'm not a big makeup person. So when I have to get all glammed up, I go to La Creme Faces. I can only go to somebody that I can trust with my face. They specialize in glam makeup and even special effects makeup. So you could be turned into the beauty or even the beast. So make sure you follow them on Instagram and make your appointment today at La Creme Faces. You guys ready to play a game? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. It's time for Off the Top, our improv creative game. You guys can play too. So stick around. Let's see what today's game is. I'm going to shuffle. And Mia is going to pick a card. And 
Ooh. Okay. What do you what do you mean? <laughs> I love that game! <laughs> we had so much fun when we played this game last time. I'm really excited. Let me dig into my bag of games. <laughs> All right, so what do you mean? This is how it goes. You guys are gonna pick four cards. Each? Each of you. I'm slow. All right. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> Sorry, five <laughs> cards. You're gonna pick five cards each. And then I'm gonna present situations, questions, and whatnot. And you're gonna tell me what picture goes with what I said. Okay, so just okay. pick whatever five cards you want. That's three. I do poetry, I don't do counting. <laughs> She's like, I'm a poet, not an accountant. <laughs> That's two. All right, wait, can we see this? You can look at your pictures. I feel like this. You might have got more extra yeah, I think I got a lot of extra ones. You got okay. five? Yeah, I got five. All right, bet. I feel like I oh picked the gosh. same five, even though I went all over your hand to get them. <laughs> <laughs> I have one that's Do they all have the same face? <laughs> nah. This is great. This is okay. Great. I feel like they're over me in some way. All right, there's a lot of cards here. Bear with me. Bear with me. I make a lot of faces. Do you, man? I do too. Okay. So here's one I think that we all could relate to. <laughs> when he said he texts you after work, but that was a year ago. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> do I just show you? That's not, that's not on it. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Why are you so emotional? I can't she, help it. And this is a this is like the fuck. <laughs> what? That's so you, and that's so you. Yes. <laughs> yes. I can't okay, okay, it. okay, okay. Um. <laughs> I don't know. I can't read these cards. They make me laugh. Okay. <laughs> When you finally get home and can be ugly in peace. Oh, God. Oh, my God. <laughs> When the unsaved number in your phone starts catching feelings. Mm. <laughs> real quick, real quick. Yo, she gave me the visa. What are you doing? Oh no, it says, oh no, no baby, baby, what, what are, are you doing? doing? Called the wrong number. <laughs> because Anthony, you order Chinese food? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh oh, I know I I hate this. I hate when I wish I could like have my own meme for this. When you're doing the dishes and you touch soggy food. Uh, oh. uh, I mean, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I love that scene. It's really just like <laughs> I quit. I don't want to do it. You got this part. That's definitely me. That's when I'm like, when can I afford to hire a housekeeper? Like, like seriously. Where these black kids at? <laughs> My mother promised me I could make them do dishes. Uh, okay. When someone asks you if you voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> Another one. I gotta go back here. I gotta go back here. Yeah. <laughs> Like the fuck? <laughs> Why would I do that? <laughs> she gave us that one again. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask you one more. Okay, when you see when you sneeze and nobody says bless you. Oh no, that's just I'm just gonna give a reaction. <laughs> <laughs> no bless she me. No bless me. For real. How dare you? I say it. I'd be like God bless me. Yeah, and then I'd be like too. thank you. Like I take it so offensively. Like you're not. But what's bless the me? meme for it? What's the meme for it? You don't I have my own. own. I, I don't have. I don't have one. She for said that. I made my own. I made my own. That was That's it. it. Yeah. I gave you mine. It was just, I mean, the next damn, this is like, fuck the cards. <laughs> I gotta give it to you in real life. <laughs> <laughs> that one was real spiritual. All right, all right. right. I'll, give you, I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. Who raised you? Damn, who raised you? Damn, this nigga's mama. Uh, <laughs> so here, 
let's freeze frame all of that and make our own memes of the j Rose experience. Oh my gosh, this game is awesome. Yeah, um, I gotta get this. I know, right? This is like, this is great. I play this with my kids. But some all of these cards, they're not children appropriate, are they? Oh, no, no, not some sorry. of them. No, all right, but definitely not. Um, just filter it out. Yeah, yeah just filter yeah. it out real quick. Okay. So I'm gonna ask you guys one more question, and not for the game. Um, this is just a question I like to ask every guest before we wrap up. Um, I have this belief that creative people are supernatural. Mm-hmm. We have superpowers that other people don't have. We do things that other people can't do. So I want to know, what is your superpower? Ooh. Oh, snap. I don't know. I feel like somebody else will tell you better than I can. Yeah, <laughs> I feel stop. like I'm not necessarily in touch with my superpower. Um, I don't know. No, but you got but it. I think it's yeah, a my... vulnerability. I, honestly, um, I think that emotional side of me, it can be a superpower. Because, it's, you know, some people look at it as, as a weakness, but I also look at it as, like, they, I have so much of a good ability to, like, connect and just be there, understand a lot of people. Maybe a bit too understanding, but, hey, that's neither here nor there. Yeah. That. But, you know, yeah. just, just I think that that helps out a lot. Yeah. So, I think maybe my passion, because mm. I approach everything with a high level of zeal. Yeah. And it winds up inspiring other people in Absolutely. that moment to either step in in the same way that I am or apply that to something else they're doing. Yeah. So I think that my passion is infectious. Mm. Yes. It really is. Yeah. Your emotions yeah. and your passion <laughs> is definitely very, very addicting. I know when I'm around you guys, I want to cry and kick doors down at the same time. <laughs> So thank you, ladies, for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate you guys. Can you please tell the audience where they can find you? Thank you for having us first off. Like, <laughs> of course. Love you. Love you. Thank you. <laughs> um, you can find me on social media. Instagram is L-Y-S-E-A-A-A. It's just Lisey. Best friend calls me that. Don't know. It's just a thing. And also, you can check out my album, Voices. Well, not my album. The whole album, Voices of New York. I'm definitely on there with a lot of other poets. She was one of them. She is amazing. And I definitely listened to it about six times. But hey, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm Neamora. You can find me in Harlem. But if you can't make it up there, you can find me on the gram <laughs> at Poet Neamora. Uh, my website, neamora.net. And I'm on Twitter too, but I'm really not that great there. So. Twitter is like, no, nah, that's like, I need to vent there. So don't follow <laughs> me. You see me, just skip it because I've been talking my shit. <laughs> awesome. And if you guys aren't following us yet, Please go to the gram and follow our new Instagram, J Rose Experience. Hit that follow button and hit that subscribe button on the YouTube. <laughs> Thanks and for turn your me. notifications oh, on. Oh, yeah, turn your notifications on so you know when we drop in new episodes. Yes. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Keep growing. Bye.